Hello, everyone. Dave Landry here from DaveLandry.com. This is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank all you guys and girls for attending. I've been working a little harder to get the word out. Looks like a few of you have received it. If you do want to see these shows live, if you're watching recording on YouTube and would like to participate live, we'd love to have you. The more the merrier. DaveLandry.com slash webinar. Register if the even if the link is old or the date is old, and you'll have access to all upcoming shows for at least the next six or eight months. All right, what are we talking about? Well, obviously, current market conditions, your questions on trading, your favorite stock in crypto picks. To, if you don't mind, hold off on the stock picks and crypto picks while we're in the presentation mode in the PowerPoint. But once we hop into the live charts, feel free to fire away. I want to update the market timing and talk about some simple techniques there. And then I received uh, some lengthy emails from somebody who's newer to the methodology and a little newer to trading. And I'd like to address that here. And there's a lot of good stuff, even if you're, that's why I added that, or new, not so new at the last minute, some things we need to relearn and do. And that'll make a lot of sense in just one minute. There's this claim screen, as you know, you can lose money trading, ours off to sum it up. All predictions are about the future and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. All right, so I wanna follow up on the 10% system and where are we now and also avoiding bad things like now. So TFM 10% system, just real quick, cause I know we go over this nearly every week, especially now the market's back to being fairly questionable. The byline as I call it, and I guess I need a better name for it or percent of close is a 50 week close less 10%. So right here, that would be the close and you take 10% away from that. And that's where your buy line would be. And the parameters for that are over on the left side of the screen. This plugin is, plug is free. He tried to say, if you have ACP, all you have to do on YouTube is like the video and get it for free. I'm not sure that it's gonna be free forever, but for now it's free. And the date again is September 15, 2022. Anyway, we had a sell signal here and the system is real simple. A close below the buy line and a close below the 50 week moving average. That's it. You want a GTFO when that occurs, or certainly think seriously about it. And the buy signal is two lows above the 50 week simple moving average. And also it has to close above the buy line. So here's your sell there. You can see both of those things happen for the sell side at least. It closed below the 50, it closed below the buy line. And then you can see a few weeks later, we had a buy signal. Now it's hard to see, and I'll show you that in just one second. And then that followed by another sell signal. And I think the diaper change, meaning the how much money you would have lost had you stayed in the market from there to here is about 13%. And 13% is substantial. If you think about it, a million bucks, what's that, 130K? That begins to add up after a while, right? Now, just to show you that last buy signal, so that's one bar of Landry Light, and then this would be two, and I didn't actually notice there was Landry Light, and I also saw that the market was weak, so I knew it was improving, but I, I didn't think we had a, a buy signal, and somebody pointed out that we did, and I said, well, I didn't take it, so to speak, or I didn't take any action based on that buy signal. I do have a couple of longer-term things that that aren't my core portfolio. The core portfolio is trading, but I do have some of my kids with little money's left over from college. Um, yeah, I can't go there. <laughs> I almost said something I shouldn't have said, but anyway, but you can see that it wasn't a, a, a great buy signal, so to speak. And the other thing was it was on weakness. So as a trend follower, I like to buy on strength and also, on that signal, as I've been saying, we we're only a few percent away from all-time highs. I figured, okay, well, let's just wait until we get to all-time highs and see if we could stick there. So this isn't something I follow purely mechanically, and I don't really follow anything on a purely mechanical basis. But this is probably one of the things that's a little closer because when I have a signal with this, I certainly do pay attention to what's happened, especially on the sell side. I'm not as excited about the buy side on this particular system there's and there's often other ways to get into the markets maybe daily bow ties or something like that especially if you're longer term bottoming off of lows but anyway as a trend follower i don't like buying on 
weakness and you could see it was just a smidge above that moving average and when you're looking at the longer term chart you can't even see it especially i like to use thick moving averages so if that moving average unless the moving average is super thin you i wouldn't even notice that it was that you had the landry light now as i've been saying quite a bit one of my favorite quotes and i, I never did get around or actually found the paper yeah i haven't found the paper yet but i need to find it um i want to say charlie kirk referenced it i always get charlie kirk and david keller mixed up you get so much good stuff from both of them but one of those guys referenced Vallejo and gaia and they wrote a paper where bad things happen i think they won some kind of award for that or something and they were talking about the 200 day moving average i believe and that's when a market is below the 200 day moving average but in this case if you take a look at the 50 week moving average which i have in here which i guess would be on a daily a 250 day moving average just for interesting sake i know you want to party with me but you can see bad things happen my little kunash just slipped out there bad things happen bad things happen when you get below that buy line and also when you're below that 50 week moving average now the market doesn't always implode when that happens and there's been a few times throughout history where the market recovered, obviously. But it does kind of give you an idea when the market is getting iffy. And as I've said quite a bit, in 2015, 2016, those are really horrible markets to trade. And even though the market went back up, it would have been a good time to be mostly out of the market. So there was another little dip in 2019. Market did come back. And obviously the pandemic. Now the pandemic had a 28% diaper change moment, meaning that after had you not exited the market on the sell signal, you would have lost 28% of your money. Now it did come back, but as I often preach, that'll work until it don't. Just look back at this chart, look at 2000 and look at 2000 and a 2009, down here towards the lows, we were at 13-year lows. So let's say you started saving for a kid's college when he was a toddler, right? Three or four years. Oh, by the time he's ready to go to school, all of a sudden, market loses half of its value. So you're going to be a hurt and pop should that occur. And I'm going to re reiterate that point in just a minute. And so we're back in sell mode, as you can see, back below the buy line and back below the 50-week moving average. Now, this is the aforementioned diaper change I was talking about. And if you would have taken that whipsaw signal, which is fine. If you follow it mechanically, that's fine. I would be more impressed with you if you were newer to trading and following something like this and like something like this and followed it mechanically than if you were using a little discretion like I do with something like this. But that's there's nothing wrong with that. Now, what's interesting is the even though you lost on the trade, you, by getting back short, you avoided a 13% diaper change moment. Now, there's the pandemic. As you can see, 28% lost. There, there's the last couple of bear markets, as you can see, 44% and 52% respectively. And then if you go back in time, you can see that there's been some pretty serious spills throughout history. And the slide isn't big enough to see the Great Depression, but that was an 83% drop. And you're like, well, Dave, that was in. This is now, well, as I often say, whenever I talk about market timing, the NASDAQ lost 70 something percent of its value in 2000. So that's a pretty impressive slide. And so far, by the way, knock on wood, come in. Uh, <laughs> the, this system has gotten you out right before every ugly bear market. Now, will it whipsaw you now and then? As we say in Fargo, you betcha. These are some things I've said in recent times talking about market timing. Just know that every now and then, I say every now and then, you're like, Dave, it's not that often. Well, it's often enough to be concerning, but every now and then the market loses half of its value. So learn some market timing now 
so you'll be ready for the next time. All asset classes at some point in your lifetime will lose half of their value. Bitcoin just lost well over half of its value. Gold is on its way to losing half of its value. We'll take a look at that in just a few minutes. And I remember a few times throughout my brief time on earth where gold has lost over half of its value and any other asset class for that matter. So one thing I just want to point out real quick too is don't buy stuff that's going down less than everything else. And Dave Keller, a few weeks back, when I said you can't eat relative strength, he said, well, it's interesting you say that when back when he was head of Fidelity's technical analysis research, they the joke was that they ate the relative strength line. So if you're always supposed to be invested, then yeah, then then be in the strongest areas, even though they're going down. But as a trader, we have the luxury of not having to follow a prospectus. And if, if a prospectus says, hey, you need to be 100% in cash, I'm sorry, if a prospectus says you need to be 100% invested, then you need to be 100% invested. I would much rather treat cash as an asset class. And right now, I'm sitting on a lot of cash. I only have about three open positions. And one thing I often say too, and I meant I didn't really meant to go mean to go through all of these, but it looks like I'm going through most of them anyway. It's always darkest right before it gets more dark. So never buy a market just because it's low. The Nasdaq, getting back to the Nasdaq in 2000, was down 50%, and then it dropped another 50%. And I was traveling internationally once, speaking internationally, and a guy got up before me, and he wasn't speaking English. But the gist of what he was saying was that you should sell puts when a market's down 50%. And that'll work until it don't. It's kind of interesting too, Warren Buffett did that and and came out smelling like a rose, but the market could have easily dropped and you know his old simple little, let's just buy some value and sit on it thing, all of a sudden he's selling derivatives, you know? So that's a whole nother story, but that could have ended badly for him. Anyway, the gist of what the guy was saying was sell puts when a market's down 50%. I don't think you have enough of a representative sample statistically to prove that that works. I think you have enough of a representative sample to prove that it doesn't. <laughs> and then of course, a 30 EMA is my little friend. And I wanna talk a little bit about that. I thought it would be cool. I know you wanna party with me, but I thought it'd be cool to put the 30 and take a look at with what uh, Baleo and Gaiad talked about. So bad things happen below the 30 EMA on a weekly chart. So I wanted to put a 30 EMA on a weekly. Last week we looked at the 30 EMA on a daily. So red is bad things and green is good things. So as I was finishing up these slides, I got to thinking, well, let's not just talk about bad things, let's talk about good things. And good things are when a market is above the 30 EMA, that's a good thing, whether it's a daily or a weekly. So you could see going into the, obviously the 2000 bear market, the 1999 run was pretty damn good. And if you look at the little indicator at the bottom, or as I call it, illustrator, it just shows you the number of bars or counts the number of bars, however you want to look at it, that were above the 30 EMA. And again, this is a weekly chart. Notice you had lots of green below, and the market mostly went up. And then you went to nearly all red for a long, long time, a couple of years. Wow, I'm just I'm just kind of adding that up. All red or zero, meaning no upside Landry light on a 30 week EMA. This is why I love presenting and teaching so much because I learn a lot in the process. Now notice the nice little bull market we had coming out. Of that bear market, we might have had one little, if I squint my eyes, it looks like we had one day or one week of Landry light, but the rest of it was green. So maybe a little system there was would be like, hey, if you have more than a couple of weeks of Landry light to the downside, meaning the highs are less than the 30 EMA on a weekly chart, then you might want to think about getting out. And of course, look at that bear market. I mean, this is really cool. I'm kind of excited about this. I know I'm such a nerd, but you had all red, unless I squint my eyes, I can't see any green in there. 
and you had a couple of cases where it intersected the moving average but didn't close above it. So once again, my little friend continues to do really, really well when it comes to helping you stay on the right side of the market. So I, I'm going to make a point in a second where I want you to remember how simple this little simple thing is, the stupid thing is, and how I can keep you on the right side of the market. Anyway, a little red there. Market did get a little iffy. I do remember that. 2011, 2012 was one of those eh years where the market just went crazy and choppy. Nice little uptrend begins here. And then mostly had a little bit of red, tiny, tiny bit of red if you squint your eyes, but mostly green all the way up. Party in Seattle. We have breweries. Cracker Union Redmond. It's going to be crazy schedule up there, but boy, it'd be great to uh, to grab a beer. Yeah, I'm kind of looking forward to the breweries, really am. And you can see we had a little downside Landry Light, 2015, 2016. Again, as I said a minute ago, that was another horrible time to trade. You probably would have wanted to be mostly out of the market during those times. I know it was a difficult time for me. Nice little uptrend again ensues. A little bit of questionable times, 2019. The thing to think about, like a 2019 and especially 2020, is the old hedge fund adage, he who fights and runs away lives to fight another day. So again, back to the upside. And then, of course, we had the pandemic. Now it came right back. Well, that'll work until they don't. And it's like anytime there's a big market slide, the market comes back. I meet a man on the street, I bump into a man on the street, and we start talking trading. And <laughs> they always say, Man, I wish I'd have bought more. I'm glad I ha held on. I'm thinking, Oh, geez, that definitely will work until it don't. And by the way, the other thing, too, as I often say, I had a friend that visited once or twice during all this mess. And when that market was dropping and dropping and dropping, and he was still in, and he was probably down, he was down 28% at least from my sell signal, and probably could add another 10% or more on that. He was a hurt and pop, and he wasn't sleeping well at night. And he may be done with markets forever now, which is a shame, because of course, it came back. And hopefully, he's not dipping a toe back in. Nobody calls me when things are going well. Nobody calls me as soon as things get a little iffy. But I guarantee freaking to you, my phone's going to ring when this market goes down 50%. When, not if, right? Not that this cycle should go down 50%. I'm not fear-mongering. But you can see we've been mostly red and certainly no green for quite some time here in the market. So the 30 EMA, once again, holds true. One thing I do kind of like with, with simple moving averages, it, it's weird. With long, long-term charts and short, short-term charts, I actually like the simple moving averages in many cases better, but I may be changing my tune a little bit after seeing the performance with the Landry light, at least on this 30 EMA, which I've studied coming into this presentation and kind of learning a lot now. But with longer term moving averages, you're going to have a little bit of lag, but lag is okay sometimes in that market timing to help keep you from chasing your own tail. And maybe you could ride out some of these corrections. And that's why I'm using a simple moving average, but I'm also using a hard sort of stop or functions as a stop, so to speak, 10% buy line. So hopefully that makes sense. A little lag is okay with market timing. All right. A couple of random thoughts on market timing. Some is better than none. It doesn't have to be rocket science. Even a system with more on in the name could do quite well, especially at avoiding those diaper change moments. You need to think in terms of performance-based investing, and that's one thing I've been working on a little bit here and there and really want to revisit, especially with my trading simplified show that I do for stock charts. And that is to look at your investments from a performance based standpoint like a coach would look at his players like an employee employer would look at his employees okay you've got three guys busting their butt and one guy sitting on his butt well who's getting fired well that's obvious you see the guy sitting on his butt but when it comes to investing and trading people will keep the stinkers in their portfolio and they'll get rid of the good stuff 
they'll act just the opposite. As I've been saying quite often when it comes to market timing, shit happens and it can ha it can take a long time to come back, sometimes 25 years or more. And once again, avoiding the diaper change is key. And that's both mentally and monetarily. My I was really worried about my buddy who was losing his buttocks. One thing I wanted to mention over the last couple of weeks, and I talked about this before, shifting gears here. Any questions on market time or anything before we shift gears? All right. Well, one thing I, was, I wanted to show you, and I put together a little chart last minute. This is Bitcoin and the S&P 500. And they do diverge here and there, but quite often there is a very positive correlation. Now, there was a divergence, obviously, before the market slid. And, you know, maybe these divergences could help us a little bit, can kind of hint of a market change. I don't know. I haven't done the research on that. Just kind of looking at it again as we are talking tonight. But for the most part, you can see there's a very high correlation. Stocks go up. Bitcoin in general goes up, stocks go down, Bitcoin goes down. And we'll take a look at live Bitcoin in a few minutes. But anyway, all right, so letters, we do get letters. And this is from someone, like I said, who's newer, somewhat newer to trading and much newer to my methodology. So he's trying to figure out where to start and I'm going to get him into my gold membership and have him go through all the courses there and hopefully get on a trading service so he can see the setups in real time. And I'll talk about the importance of that in a few seconds. I definitely think I need to improve my setups and clearly outline my setup rules. The setup section of my trading plan is still lacking details. Last week, I finished reading two of your books, Layman's and... I think it's Dave Landry's 10 Best Setups and Strategies or something. I forget the name of that one already. <laughs> and I've begun to review and look to identify those, set up, those setups on the charts. Now, it's very important to see the methodology in action. And that's something that I really started doing a lot of, especially in my Trading Simplified show, because you need to see what's my thought process. And I show these mystery charts, which are charts taken straight from the trading service. I just black out the ticker. And why I like the setup ahead of time, of course. And then I follow up and reveal the mystery chart, and you can see what happens. And then you can learn the money management. And I do, I'm going to do a little bit of that here, too. But it's very important to see methodology in, in action. And years ago, I was hired to help someone pick stocks. It was a dream job, believe me. I, just, I couldn't believe I was getting paid to do that. It's kind of a pinch me type of thing. It's like, I'm getting paid to do this. I can work from home. I can trade. I could, it, this was just wonderful. And I did the programming and ran the programs and I would start giving him setups and he was like, uh, that's not one of my setups. And I'm like, oh, yes, it is. And I showed him that it fit the program because it did this and did that or whatever. He goes, well, I don't like it, you know? And then over time he would tell me what he liked and didn't like. And I learned a lot in the process. And also, as I said, a thousand times, by complete accident, the way I started looking at a couple thousand stocks a day was while the computer was running. And back then, it took about 45 minutes to run the scans. Right now, if I hit refresh, it's blink of the eye that fast. But I had another program that could read the database. I made a copy of the database. That's back when the stock databases were more open. But I had another little simple, quick and dirty program that would show me all the stocks in a database that fit certain criteria or tradable universe. I forget what it was, but I, but anyway, it was a way kind of like IntelliCharts where I could bang on the keyboard like the rat going for the cocaine and go through a lot of charts. And that's where I learned how to read charts because I would present things while the scans were running. I would do that for 45 minutes and before the scans were finished. A lot of times I'd call up and say, what about this? What about this? What about that? And then I quickly learned that not everything that that quantified qualified, okay? And that's a missing piece. And that's something that I was really excited about to talk about tonight. I don't know, I'm such a nerd tonight. And I know you want to party with me. But that that's such a missing piece that's not out there is 
the, the stock selection, the stock picking, and seeing the actual methodology work. And, and you could do that for free, by the way. You can see it, at least historically, save yourself a lot of time and money learning. And then I would love to have you become a member and a service member, of course, over time. But you can go and look at the service archives and you could see me talk about what I like every night for the past, I don't know how long I've been doing this, 20 years. And I know there's a, a gap in there somewhere that needs to be filled in. But anyway, it is important to see the methodology in action. Now, one thing I would suggest, and again, because not every setup that quantifies qualifies, is learn stock selection and its nuances. Now, I have a 14-hour course in stock selection, and one day I need to go in and redo that course with current conditions. And what I did was I taught the course, and then I spent the next six or seven or eight weeks, and I, I did the same thing with the IPO course, and maybe skip a week here, here and there to let the market change conditions a little. And then I would pick stocks each week, and then we we go through them and, and look at them. And, and I think it's a wonderful exercise for everyone, myself included. But the thing is with stock selection is 90% of it can be learned really quick. It's the other 10% that takes the other 13 and 13 hours and 50 minutes. <laughs> so I have a trading quick clip on YouTube and I'll put our link to it at the end of this video or maybe down in the comments too. And in that quick, quick clip, I call it a crash course in stock selection. And just to kind of give you a Reader's Digest, those of you who are old enough to know what that is, <laughs> it's a summary, right? You don't want to trade a stock that looks like electrocardiogram. You want the stock to persist in its movement. You want it to be accelerating and not decelerating. The most important thing of all is the net-net price change. Is it higher, lower, or about the same as it was? And right now, if you didn't know anything about markets, the S&P is about where it was three or four months ago. It's not trending. If you're a trend follower, what should you be doing? Nothing, absolutely nothing. Ideally, it should thrust, pull back, thrust, pull back, thrust, pull back, and hopefully rinse and repeat quite a bit. It shouldn't break out after it pulls back, have a pullback breakout and then come right back in. Same thing for a breakout from a base. It shouldn't come all the way back into the base. And believe me, a lot of people, if you go in and look at, uh, not you guys here, because you guys are in the Facebook group and you're up to speed on everything. But if you go back and look at some older week of charts, when my base was a lot bigger, I guess a lot of tire kickers, so to speak, in the group. Nothing wrong with that, but you know, try out a few things, of course. But you'll see that probably 90% of the problems that I find with stocks, and maybe 95%, could all be related to this one chart. Gaps against the trend, for instance. Lots of overhead resistance right above the market or right below the market for shorts. So that's just kind of a, a nutshell screen on stock selection. But if you learn that, the rest is just a few little details. It comes with experience. And then eventually a little intuition, not to be confused with intuition, which is a Sakota term. You got to be careful of that, trying to make things happen. Like right now is a market where you got to be really careful not to try to make things happen. Now, leading up to this email, I think I may have said most of the time people tell me what they're doing wrong in their trades. And if they don't, I can look at a few trades and tell them right out what they're doing. And as I've said a thousand times, and then they tell me, I know, I know. <laughs> so most people do know what they're doing wrong. So that kind of led into this conversation. I'm not entirely sure what I'm doing wrong, normally I search for my trades by looking for long opportunities in sectors slash industries that have been or are just beginning to outperform and short opportunities with the opposite approach, negative relative performance. I tend to identify trend, observe how the price and volume try to act and determine what side of the market strong hands are on and look for stocks that are about to enter or in initial stages of distribution slash markup or marked down. Well, a lot of that, a lot of what you're saying sounds like a, a bigger picture analysis, a 30,000 foot view, which is great, which is something you're using a lot of terms that you'd, you'd hear Dave Keller use, the markets under a distribution phase or an accumulation phase and things like that. And, and that, that analysis 
is fine and you're doing a great job with that. But what I would do instead is use a bottom up approach versus that top down approach, looking for the sectors and then you know, first see what the market's doing and then look at the sectors and then drill down into sectors and find some stocks. I would do just the opposite, let the database tell you what to do as I preach. And again, I'm looking at a couple thousand stocks each night because the, the uh, pullback scan is fairly loose parameters. I'm just looking for a recent high there. And by looking for a recent high, about 2,000 stocks will quantify. And lately, only a few stocks, if any, have qualified. I had one tonight that I mentioned in the service as an honorable mention. And I know a lot of you guys are looking for something to do. I would strongly urge against that. But if you must do something, then here, this is something that you might want to take a look at. But I let the database tell me what to do. and and and. Some of that's rubbing off, and one of you guys is a little newer to trading. The last week said the database sucks, and it does. It really does. It's like I can't find a setup to save my life. And I think I said it recently in a webinar a few nights ago. I was the night before the market tanked. I was lying in bed saying, geez, these people are probably so tired of me not showing anything. What am I going to do? How am I going to find setups? I can't find any setups. I'm, I don't have anything that I want to do position wise. And it was really starting to weigh on me a little bit. And then the next day, the market tanks really, really bad. And, I, and now I'm like, aha, now you know. So let the database tell you what to do. If the database sucks, then there's nothing to do. Now, I'm not sure how you would qualify or quantify a lot of things that you're talking about here, like our stocks being marked up or marked down a distribution and all these other things. But I can tell you this, if you can't find a setup to save your life, then it's probably not a good market to be trading. If you find a fantastic look at setup, in spite of the sector, in spite of the market, then by all means, take it, okay? So I would encourage you again to focus on setups. I mostly try to take trades based on breakout plays. If there's one indicator that I use the most for confirmation would be the MACD and he's got PPO. I, I, I don't remember what PPO is. I think it's some sort of indicator based on, I don't know, price, I guess. <laughs> I have recently spent more time looking for price volatility contraction. Okay, before we go any further, I would ignore volume, except for making sure the stock is liquid enough to trade, okay? As a general statement, somewhat thinner stocks can offer better opportunities. The only problem you run into when you get too thin on the stock is one, of course, liquidity, and two, technical analysis has to have a big enough group of traders or investors however you want to look at it to make it work you need enough people to read the mass psychology of the market if you don't have enough traders in there one or two traders can really push the market around i saw a stock i was kind of interested in and it was sort of moving up today and it got an alarm and it only trades like ten thousand. it was only like ten thousand shares that were traded for the day or something like that i'm like eh, i need to be a little careful there but i usually don't use any kind of volume. I just look at the daily volume use, usually, and if it has enough daily volume, then I know there's enough players to make the technical analysis work. And by the way, part of that apologetics for technical analysis is that the charts do not represent the entity, okay? That's, the charts don't recommend, don't represent the underlying stock they represent how people feel about that underlying stock. And, and that's a very important thing to wrap your head around. A, ch a chart, a stock is not a company and a company is not a stock. They're two completely different things. And how people feel about the stock is reflected in the chart. Now, breakouts are prone to failure. And back before everybody had a computer on the desk, then breakouts worked a little bit better. There's some old, old breakout systems that used to work but back before my day. Uh, the Turtles did really great with a very simple breakout system, but they were, not to take anything away from them, but they were in the right place at the right time. 
and I don't I don't know if any of them and if you know some some of them that are successful to this day let me know but I, I know not to be shod in a Friday because I would never do that not in this business because I get beat up enough I, I, I'd hate to see anybody else get beat up but most of those turtles you haven't really heard from them in a long long while and I do have some you kind of know people through the industry and people tell you about other people. And I know it's hearsay, but it's it's not good in many cases. In some of the cases, it's it's very specific, but that's enough. That's a two beer minimum story. Maybe we could drink a beer up in Seattle and talk about this. He said he's using the MACD with PPO. I'm not sure what that is. I know what the MACD is, so don't send me, you know. Somebody will send me an email. I use stochastics and I'm like, what's stochastic? And they'll spend three pages explaining it to me. I know I say this all the time. And I'll, I'll be like, I know what a stochastic is. I just don't use them. You want to trade the charts only, sans the occasional moving average, obviously, before adding any indicators. Now, he mentions the compression and volatility and looking for expansion. That's kind of trading 2.0. And with volatility without going down that rabbit hole as i've done before believe me if you can't sleep at night there's plenty of videos on youtube on my youtube channel dave landry oh, youtube.com slash c slash dave landry you might want to start with the quick clips first there's 50 something videos there to get you into all this other stuff but volatility is tricky without going too far down the rabbit hole just do know that it's a little bit more complex a lot more complex in price and the first move is often a false one. Years ago, I had a little system and it never got published. It was supposed to be published and one thing led to another, one thing happened and I just scrapped it or it was scrapped for me. <laughs> Two beer minimum there too. But basically it would look for a low volatility situation, a move in one direction, and then you would take the move in the opposite direction. PPO is the same as a MACD, but it's percentage based as to normalize patterns between dissimilar price patterns. And then David says, in addition, he says PPO stands for percentage price oscillator or period price oscillator from Sam. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, I don't I don't use that stuff. It it, it might have some use, but I always believe in trading off the charts first before adding any indicators. I've been trading for three years, which is not a long time, as you probably know. The first year was profitable, the second two were so-so. I feel that I have learned a lot, but have not yet proven myself to myself that I could handle a larger account. I have not developed a repeatable edge yet. Very key thing there, and I want to pick that apart. I have taken this year's market changes as an opportunity to get more comfortable with looking at the short side. Okay, first of all, if I had to bet on two different people, and I could think of several clients right now, and if I had to bet on who's going to be the longer term winner, the the trader that comes in when everything is going great and gets a little full of himself or even thinks that I'm the grand poobah or whatever. And as I said before, I know I kind of repeat the dead horse and all those things, but <laughs> you try speaking two hours a week and, and and have everything brand new. You know, I need some new stories. I need to get out. This COVID killed me to get out. But I'm getting out soon. Uh, it'd be better if I was getting out with with a group of uh, you guys as opposed to the uh, a group of my peers, not that you guys are my peers, but I'm, but you know what I mean, just so I could see what's being done out there on an individual basis, on, uh, firsthand. But anyway, through the years, I've had people come in and, and print money and then go do stupid things like quit jobs and tell the boss they have off, et cetera. And... I don't know of any one of those people that have made it longer term. They never bother talking to me ever again. And I would I would assume if they were out there printing money, they would be like, hey, Dave, thanks for, for giving me a hand. There's a few guys out there that actually 
Uh, I don't know what, what period they came in, but there's a few guys out there. One I'm thinking of in particular, he's occasionally on TV and, and uh, he's nice enough to give me credit for somebody that helped him early on. But anyway, I digress. My point being that if you have instant success, I think it's much more dangerous than if you struggle and maybe have a tiny bit of instant success, but then get your ass handed to you quickly. Joe Corona used to travel the world years ago. Joe Corona, he had some business dealings or was partners with Tony Saliva. Tony Saliva is of market wizard fame. And uh, Joe's a super, super nice guy, super fun guy. And he used to travel the world in search of volatility. And he spent a lot of time in India, but he finally gave up and said that Gandhi's revenge was, was getting to him. He couldn't take it anymore. But that's another story altogether. And I wish, I don't know what happened to the picture. I would kill for the picture, but um, he liked my simple stuff, even though he was a complex kind of op option trader. And it was just, um, I'm just humbled by that. You know, Larry Connors once uh, was asking like at a round table, who do you follow? Who do you like? And he said, Dave Landry. He goes, he goes wait a minute. He goes, you're, you know, you're, you like a trend following moron. <laughs> you're this complex option trader. He goes, no, I just like the way Dave looks at things. It keeps it simple even though he's using complex options. Anyway, long story endless, he had a picture of this Indian guy with his feet kicked up on the desk and he was reading my book. And he sends me an email with the subject, Indian trend following moron, which I lost the picture on one of my old computers. It, it, it's a shame. But anyway, the point being, and believe it or not, I have one. <laughs> like if I'm, I'm telling some telling the story of my wife, I'll start doing this. Like it's common. There is a point eventually. I'm going to bring it all the way back around. But the point being is, he one time told me, he goes, Dave, I love when the new guys get their ass handed to them right away. And, I, and I'm just going to make some assumptions here. And maybe it's a little presumptuous, but I'm assuming that these people aren't wealthy people that he's hired to work for him and they need the job. And they're probably scared shitless after losing money right away. Like, oh, crap, I'm going to lose my job. I just lost money. I am a failure. But Joe said he likes the new guys to get their ass handed to him right away. He goes, that way to learn to respect risk. He says the new guys that come in that do phenomenally well, they just hit the market cycle perfect and they make a lot of money. They get a little cocky. And when they finally get whacked, when, not if, they get they go down hard, okay? So anyway, I've done a whole presentation or most of a presentation on this. In fact, I, I drew this little curve out. I was drawing this curve out myself. <laughs> And then I started searching the internet for, uh, you know, false confidence and all these other things. And then I found this curve that looks just like the, the little curve I was trying to draw. I was like, oh, okay, well, somebody's already done that research. But what happens is, and, and I've drawn a couple other lines in my uh, diagram, and those videos are out there. Again, if you can't sleep at night, the uh, stealing a joke from Greg Morris, just don't uh, operate heavy machinery after after viewing. But Towards the, the the right side of this chart, what, ha what happens is you're actually smarter than you think you you're actually smarter than you think you are, as opposed to not as dumb as you are now. Like you'll have this overconfidence early on, especially if if you just hit it just right. So anyway, without digressing too far, doing well initially, long story endless, is actually and can be detrimental to you longer term it might take you longer to learn now what he's saying is key he he doesn't have enough confidence just yet to up his trading size and most people which is weird it's like they're not doing that great or they finally start doing okay okay at best and all of a sudden they just plow a whole bunch of money in the market like okay i'm gonna do this now it worked for a little while it's gonna work you know as opposed to just kind of slowly chipping away at it, slowly increasing their size. And I've had a few people, and a few being a key word in that sentence, that have sort of trading like a tenth of percent of their accounts for their stop, and then they bump it to a quarter. It seems like it takes them forever. But you know what? Those people stick with the methodology longer term. The people that come in and trade aggressively, if they hit it right, then they blow up, right? When, when the shit does hit the fan. When not if again, 
but if you slowly ease into it, you get through the ups and downs and you start to develop a stomach for it, so to speak. So again, if you're not satisfied with a small account performance, you're not gonna be satisfied with a larger account. Now, what are you saying in here? There's a lot, there's, there's, a, there's a trader in the making in here, and I'll tell you why. He's using the right terminology and the right phraseology. I have not developed a repeatable edge yet. Repeatability is key. It's something that I spent a lot of time on. As I've said before, there was an e-mini trader years ago, back when I was part of a much larger website, and he was making like 50 e-mini mini trades a day, and it was driving the clients absolutely batshit because by the time they were getting in, he was already getting out. Now, this guy was probably a successful trader, but is it repeatable, okay? There are a lot of false prophets out there, obviously, on the internet. Um, I would never be shot on Friday, but if somebody is bilking someone, they deserve to get the screws screwed to them, okay? And I'm thinking of one group individual, which drove me nuts with all the Yahoo, oh, Yahoo uh, YouTube, oh, they were Yahoo ads too, because they're coming from Yahoo's, but uh, all their ads about I'm the greatest trader in the world and all these false claims and all this other bullshit. You know, whereas I'm the opposite instruction spectrum. It's like, why would you listen to me? I'm like, I'm a trend following more. Hey, I got my ass handed to me, you know. <laughs> but longer term, I think I'll do okay. But repeatability is key. So forget about those false prophets and think about the people who hit it just right. Like I said, or like I mentioned earlier, I talked about Tony Saliba. Tony Saliba made like $80 million trading options. And and I read that in Market Wizards. And, and when I got to finally meet him, I asked him about it and he says, Dave, you know, probably couldn't do that again. That was the, I was in the right place at the right time. Now, you can't take that away from him because he was smart. Many people were in the right place at the right time. How many right places at the right times have you been in in your trading career? And then just you weren't, you didn't have the wherewithal or you didn't recognize that you were in the right place at the right time to take advantage of it. But Tony Schlieb was also not out there saying you too can make $80 million. So there were a few people throughout history, mostly in 1999, that did incredibly well doing a bunch of risky things, and they can never do that again. You know, what have you done for me lately is, is the thing. So repeatability is key. It's something I can go on and on, and on about. I know, too late. Huh? <laughs> I really can. Now, he said, I have taken this year's market change as an opportunity to get more comfortable with looking at the short side. Well, if you figure out how to get more comfortable with shorting, write me a letter. <laughs> shorting is very, 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 very difficult. I've become more and more selective on the short side. If we get into a longer term bear market where we do trend lower in a fairly persistent manner, then I will be shorting more and more. Right now, while we're zipping, uh, whips on back and forth. I'm not looking to do a lot of shorting. I'm keeping an eye out for them, but I'm not looking to do a lot of shorting. So we have this big old whack like we just had. Well, nothing really set up for me to be short on that day. I mean, other than if I'm going to do something intraday, like jump on the VIX or something like that, or jump on for a ride. When I do, what I do like to short is is when the market first begins to roll over. And, and earlier this year, we were doing some shorting. We did okay for a little while, then what happens? The market had this huge retrace rally, takes us, takes us out of all of our shorts, and then implodes. So shorting is really, really tough. I would encourage you to tread lightly, but I would also encourage you to, yes, learn how to short because it helps you to see both sides of the market. That is the biggest benefit of all of shorting because you're really not going to make a lot of money on the short side. And I got to keep, I got to stop saying that because I don't want to jinx myself. And I do want to continue to short stocks, but I'm always a little hesitant as a general rule to short. The longer I've been at this, the more hesitant I am. And that's been kind of backed up by meeting some people who are who've been around a lot longer than me in the markets and very smart. And and they they have come to the same conclusion. In the money puts might be the way to go, by the way, if, if that's what you're doing for the shorting. And that's that's somewhere out there on YouTube and on my website, of course. 
I feel that I do not have major issues with following my individual trade plans. Fantastic. After looking at my lack of performance, I decided to follow your advice and work on identifying and taking initial profit targets. Fantastic. IPTs, initial profit targets, and the widening of the protective stop on the remainder of the position is the closest thing that I have found to a holy grail. No matter what your trading system is, and I'm adamant about this, recently I know somebody newer to trading and, and they've been studying trading for years and they finally decided to dip a toe in. They had this big old plan on how they're going to do everything. And then they ended up just trading E-minis. And then they did okay for a while. And they were in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out. And I kept telling him, that's great. And I was a little, I always get a little jealous when people have that initial success, uh, to be honest, right? But I knew deep down he was going to run into trouble. And the problem I saw was he's taking these little bitty pieces, little bitty pieces, and occasionally he would get whacked. And I guess he got whacked enough to, to pull in the range a little bit. He's probably still ahead, smart enough to stop while he's ahead and reevaluate. But his problem was he was not positioning himself to have an occasional home run. And the potential for a lot of losses are always there, no matter how short term your trading is. So I do believe you have to position yourself for the occasional home run, but you can't just solely trade for longer term home runs. As I preach, longer term trend following is only going to be right about 23% of the time, somewhere in that number, let's say 20 round numbers, 20%. So 80% of the time you're going to be wrong trying to predict a longer term trend. It's, it's, it's virtually impossible or 80% impossible, but that's where the money is and that's where predicting a short-term trend comes in. Now, of course, I'm going to beat this dead horse because this is one of the longest stocks we've held in a while. And this triggered way back in the beginning of 20, it's set up in 2020 and it triggered in early 2021. Entry was there, stop was there. It was just a pullback. It ran from lows really well and then it pulls back. We took initial profit target. So now we have a free position, so to speak. And all we have to do is just trail a stop higher. Now, the stop always goes in the direction of the trade and only when the market goes higher. Now, I just kind of eyeballed this. I used to painstakingly go through every day and make a little tick mark and realize that's nearly an exercise in futility. If you want to do that to learn how to trade, okay, go in and, and watch the archives and every day, yeah, update these charts and put a little tick mark underneath. That would probably be a good exercise. It's very painful. It's probably part of my carpal tunnel. <laughs> but anyway, the stop only goes up when the stock goes up. You follow it up, but you follow it more and more loosely, and you let that stock kind of diverge, so to speak, from your stop. And as you can see, we've been in that one for a long, long time. Here's the portfolio as of, I guess, last night. And you can see we took that initial profit target. We risk 2% of the account. And we take profits when we're up 2%, we take off half. So we put a thousand bucks in our pocket. Our stop is at break even at that point, barring overnight gaps as I preach. We have the potential for the home run. And the worst thing can happen is we break even. So we take that swing trade just in case that's all we get. And then we end up sometimes with a nice little trend trade and we stick with that via trailing stops. In this case, which was strange, I. So there was like a $400 deposit in my account. Like, what's going on here? This is crazy. You know, I thought it was like one of those bank makes an error in your favor. <laughs> and it, I'm like, well, this is this is kind of nice. And come to find out, it, it actually pays a dividend. And very rarely do you have a momentum stock that also pays a dividend. Now, now if you go back in time, this was actually a value stock, so to speak, at one point in time that became a momentum stock. But that's a, another story altogether. In the South, or I should say in Louisiana, we call that lanyap. It means a little something extra. So a little $1,400 extra, better than the poke in the eye. <laughs> so round number is about 23 k maybe a little bit less after today on that position. And that's based on 100 k account. So that's a 23% gain, right? Now, unfortunately, there are some losses that you have along the way in getting to these great big winners. But as you can see, if you've got one stock and you make 23K on a 100K account, 
that's going to go a long ways to covering some of those losses. And that type of trade can make your year, especially if you get two or three of them. Skeletons in the closet. There have been a few issues thinking a stop order was in as GTC, but actually was in a day. Cover call strategy not managed properly. Trading three stocks recommended by friends that I did not pay close enough attention to myself. I am reminded about Livermore's comments and reminiscence. I guess he's saying, play your own game. And I've definitely burned me and I'm still holding the bag. As you probably can guess, some of these issues have been large enough to do some damage to my account. I have since, since picked myself up, although I would be lying if I told you I've sold them and accepted the loss. I have mental, just mentally accepted that they will hang around in my account for a long time. They were lessons that I hope I do not repeat. Well, shit happens sometimes twice. Because <laughs> in a grocery store one time and something happened. I knocked over something away and I said, ah, shit happens, I guess. And the big, large lady, about a biscuit shy of 300 was behind me. She says, sometimes, twice. I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm going to use that. Anyway, there's there must be 50 ways to lose your money in the market. So you put you you buy what you should be selling. You forget to put a stop. You put it a to stop too close. It goes on and on and on. So the map is not the territory. That's you've got to actually be in. You know the guy I was talking about earlier. He starts trading Z minis and all. He's done for the day. He's up three hundred dollars. He has to go get uh, an X-ray or something. And then all of a sudden he's bored in in the, in, the, in the waiting room, so he's just checking his account. And all of a sudden he's down three or four or five or six or seven thousand dollars after only making three hundred dollars for the day. Come to find out, he didn't close out all of his positions. So they're literally like moving his arm around trying to get an X-ray, and he's he's hitting his phone trying to get out of his position. So the map is not the territory. You'll find out really quick. Not a fan of covered calls. Too many parts. Too many moving parts. Not enough time to get into it tonight. The only cover call thing that I actually toyed with doing was back when those Spocs were going nuts and Larry McMillan told me that they were they were so crazily overpriced that he was buying the stock and selling the calls. But he like he he told me he also told me that because they were going so crazy, he would buy like 400 shares of stock and only sell 3 calls. And that way he made the money on the calls if he got called away or whatever, but he also had 100 shares left. So that's the only time I think a covered call strategy would be a good idea. Otherwise, you are capping your profits. And again, not enough time to get into it tonight, but we could certainly pick that apart if you want to someday. Now, play your own game. Of course, you can play mine. If, if your way of thinking jives with mine, that's fantastic because... You could use me as part of your staff, okay? A little soft sell there, but I wish I had somebody out there doing what I'm doing that could help me do what I do, you know? So I'm kind of scratching my own itch, so to speak. And it's like, hey, I'm, I've got all this excess research, so to speak. It's like, so I get to sell that research, right? Now, it's a bad idea, I think, to, to hold the bag, so to speak, on those stocks that are losing. Your loss is your loss. You have a loss. But what I would do is, if you can't just erase all that loss and forget about it, then at least put a hard stop in somewhere below the market and forget about those positions. And if you get stopped out, you get stopped out. I think mentally it could be a, a net negative to look at those losses every day. And as I preach, the neurology of a negative observation or a negative experience such as a loss, is two times, and then a couple of you guys in, in here tonight from the Facebook group have said it's 10 times, it's it's many times at least. I've seen two, two and a half, and one of you guys says 10, but it's 10 times the impact of a positive thing. And as I've said quite a bit lately, all this stuff kind of dovetails in with some other stuff I've been working on. But as I've said a lot lately is that that's what creates a gambler's ruin you end up chasing that high. And then if you really want to get into it, it's like the dopamine and all this stuff. And, you know, it used to take one, now it takes four. You don't get me high anymore. Who was that? Um, I forget the name of the band. Par Paramore, maybe? 
Now, of course, experience is what you get right after you need it the most. It's, it's, uh, I'm running late right now, so I can't get any details, but trust me, I've done a lot of things lately, like, well, as my wife says, you'll do that once, so that's okay. Now, random thoughts, and this is a general statement for, for most people who are new to trading, I've been trading for a few years, and are serious about getting better, but I'm kind of directing it to this particular email, it's like, you're closer than you think. He's using the right, like I said, phraseology, I'm not seeing any ego in what he's doing, a lot of what he's doing sounds conceptually correct. I'd actually have to see his complete methodology. I don't know if he's fully wrapped his head around how difficult breakout trading is. So he hasn't learned the nuances just yet, but he's pretty close and he's a lot closer than he thinks. And I think he's ready, so to speak. And, and as I often preach, I wake up every morning, and write three pages something I recommend you do too. And a lot of that is is could turn into a book and I've got a book in my head. And one of the sections under trading psychology is gonna be, you may not be ready. And I've had people email for 20 years. And in one case, I'm thinking this guy's, I can choose my words carefully, mentally challenged, okay? <laughs> And I said, you know, all this is in the first book. You need to read, go go reread that. He's like, well, I've been meaning to get that. So he haven't he hasn't even bothered reading the first book. So this guy's obviously not ready. He would he would rather lose money for 20 years trying to think what he thinks might be my methodology than actually trying my methodology. Now I'm not the grand poobah, but he needs to be doing something and learning something and find someone. It doesn't have to be me, but he's got to find somebody who's passionate about what they're doing and follow them and learn from them as opposed to just kind of bumping along for 20 years. So he's not ready. I guarantee you, he's still not ready. I got an email from who I think it is, and I'm getting two or three guys mixed up. I realize that, but I got an email from who I think it is the other day about a stock. Hey, have you seen this stock? And I'm like, this stock has nothing to do with the methodology. You know, so he's he's still not ready. So now it's 25 years. Anyway, I digress. <laughs> Simplify, get rid of the MACD, get rid of volume. Okay. Trade with price. Peel away complexity. And then if you must, add back some of that stuff. But if you can't trade with a blank chart, then you can't trade. Okay. You can't trade with indicators. And that's where people overcomplicate it. I am guilty too. I'd add indicator after indicator. I gave away most of my books on technical analysis because I, I, I know I'm not gonna go in and study a stochastic and an RSI and things of that nature and program all these things in. I've, I've been there, done that, okay? And my charts start getting more and more indicators to a point where you can no longer see the charts. Well, I've peeled away, you slowly peel away those indicators before you know it, you're back to the blank chart again. So simplify, forget about cover calls, too many moving parts. And again, I could really go on and on that. Use charts and only charts with occasional moving averages, again. And I would say play your own game. He mentioned that some of his friends mentioned stocks and he lost miserably on those. I get kind of get sucked into that too. I have a client that occasionally prints money scalping and I'm watching what he's doing. And it's just a, a thing of beauty and it's amazing. Now, I think he also loses money too. So he's, he's not perfect in what he's doing, but every now and then he'll print money. And I've been sucked into that game a few times. And it's like, hold on, Dave, back off. This is, you know, you're going down a rabbit hole. You shouldn't go in. So we're all guilty of these bad behaviors. And discipline, by the way, gets used up, which is completely another conversation altogether. Anyway, play your own game. And I think it's okay and even advisable, as I hinted about earlier, to find someone who could do the same research that you're doing and use them as part of your staff. I have the Facebook group, okay? I consider them my... I, I, I didn't mean to insult you earlier, but I, I consider you guys my peers, okay? And because you're you're bringing up stocks, you're bringing up things for me to look at, and I appreciate that. And, and I'm doing the same thing, obviously, through the trading service and throwing out a few things here and there in the Facebook group. So I think it's okay to to make yourself part of a group. In fact, I would encourage it. That's another conversation altogether. But make sure you're playing your own game and i have to be careful because i interact with so many people and every now and then i'll see people printing money and i just want to jump on board and what i need to 
tell myself is, yeah, jump on board, but only if it fits your way of trading. So use me as part of your staff and document, 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 document. My, uh, this, I have a remarkable, and I tried to get an affiliate link for you guys. I need to see if they ever sent it to me. I love this thing. And uh, I noticed this morning, I'm up to 500 pages so far, and I've only had a couple of months, 500 pages, handwritten pages so far. It's crazy. Write those three pages every morning, document your trades, and more importantly, document your emotions while you're trading. And that way you can go in and see what you did right, wrong, anything else. Just real quick, I know everybody here is already in Facebook, but I'd like to encourage anybody who's not to join, but you do have to have some skin in the game, okay? So you must be a gold member of DaveLander.com. It's like, I'll see people want to join and they're a member of like a hundred groups. And I'm like, well, this guy's all over the place, number one. And number two, they're not a member of DaveLander.com, not at least a gold member. So you don't have to be a member. All right, let's shift gears in the live charts. Any crypto you guys want to look at? I can't imagine there's anything to do in crypto, but let me pull it up real quick and see if there's anything worthwhile. And uh, uh, any questions on anything so far? I know I kind of went off on tangents. And then um, imagine that. I lost my window on TradingView. And also stocks, individual stocks. You want to talk about those now? Let's go over to crypto real quick. And then we're going to go over to, oh, fat fingered it. Then we'll go over to stocks and I'll go through the market pretty quick. So crypto just really hasn't been that fantastic as of late. In fact, I need to, I need to probably force myself. And that's the hard part. That's another one of those little secrets of trading is force yourself to do the homework when there's nothing to do. And that's where the beauty of me having the trading service from a, from a selfish standpoint is that I'm forced to do the research every day. And I guarantee you right now, because I know there's nothing out there, I would not have spent two or three hours after the close working on all this stuff. I just would have went home a little early. Anyway, I just want to show you Bitcoin. Bitcoin just imploded, as did stocks. Isn't that crazy? So Bitcoin is just another asset. It's it's There's nothing magical about it. I mean, listen to Michael Saylor, you think there is, but, and I love Michael Saylor. Every time I listen to him, it's like, I want to go buy something. I'm like, ah, can't do it, Dave. <laughs> I have a tiny amount hodl just for what it's worth, but I don't believe in hodling anything. It's just I've just got a little experiment going with the hardware wallet. All right, nobody wants to, any bitcoins or SHYT coins. So back when things were rolling and going, blowing and going or rolling, whatever. I would look at percentage change and you could almost just buy the, the biggest percentage change and you would absolutely print money. And we hadn't been in that market since last fall. And I know I reminisce it's every, uh, every week about how great that was. And boy, it was, um, it was sweet. But anyway, I don't really see anything to get too excited about in here. All right, let's shift gears. Let's go over to stocks. And I'm just gonna take a quick look at the market. I mean, really, there's not a whole lot to talk about. I mean, you would think there would be, but here's the bottom line. Let's take a look at the P's real quick. So the P's lately have been headed lower. They tried rallying up. Let's throw the 50 day simple in there just because it's well watched. And yeah, let's make that like red or something. Nice thick moving average. So if you were using Landry Light here, you can see we're back to downside Landry Light. We got four bars, almost a week of that. Probably when we add in tomorrow's close, we'll have uh, one whole week of Landry Light below. The main thing to note here, if you didn't know anything about markets, is your net net price change, okay? Where are we now? 39.05. Where were we back in May? 39.05 or thereabouts, okay? Watch the old lows. I mean, there's no there's no trend right now. And that's why as a trend follower, there's just nothing to do. This market was really shaping up here. As you can see, pulls back, get ready for, to get ready as it rallies out of the pullback. Nope, it didn't even take out, or barely took out, I should say, a two or three bar high, and then imploded again. One little last gasp, then right down. So there's really nothing to really gleam out of the market right now, other than 
there's just nothing to do. NASDAQ Composite is a little bit lower today, closing just shy of multi-month lows. Obviously, the old lows and all these indices, keep an eye on them. And again, the net-net move mostly sideways. Gold did implode today. Look at that, okay? Talking about losing uh, half of your value, right? Okay, let's see from here to here. Let's see what that is. Uh, it's only 20%, okay? But as you can see, gold will occasionally lose half of its value. Don't believe me? Look at the charts. Energies are kind of stronger on a relative strength basis, but they're kind of all over the place, especially as of late. So I wouldn't rush out and buy the energies. Now, for me to get excited about the energies, if we made all-time highs, then I might change my tune a little bit. A lot of areas, as I've been saying, kind of look like the overall market. There's the financials. Biotech has been improving, or is, I should say a strong on a relative strength basis, but it's just kind of all over the place too. So again, nothing to get excited about. Software broke down today, so that's a little concerning. So just go through these sectors and then pay attention to which ones are at or dear new lows i think telecom has been banging out some new lows in here so that's pretty ugly see that's trend following more on stuff okay so look it's going down right downside landry light put in your favorite moving average all right let's take a look at some individual stocks all right keep them coming i know we talk about stocks all day in facebook so I know I'm kind of last year at Dan Camp with Facebook, but as I said, that's a my wife pointed it out. It's the best thing I've ever done. Really excited about it. Yeah, this one looks pretty interesting. I did see this earlier doing my analysis. Um, it was a little skinny on the volume today. In general, it has good volume. I like the way it bottomed out, kind of at a Phoenix strat, uh, manner. The only reason I didn't show it in my lander list tonight, I don't like this big gap crazy day in here. But other than that, I hear you, Stuart. It looks pretty good. I mean, it's bottomed out. It's kind of got that Phoenix characteristic. Looks like it's ready to start going up again. But I just don't like that crazy, that crazy bar. I mean, if I had to, I mean, maybe if you had to go in and see if something bizarre happened on that day, that would cause that stupid move, okay? If you had to kind of justify it. But yeah, I hear you. It looks okay. It's bottomed out, but this bar, and then it's it's a little wild and crazy. HV 147, that's a little bit on the crazy side, obviously. But yeah, I like the way you think, Stuart. And, and like, again, it almost made the Landry list. And I was like, eh, I don't like that crazy bar. I think I put it in one of my other, uh, my momentum list, just keep an eye on it. This one looks okay. I don't like the gap in the setup, okay? And I don't like the low volume. The volume is just too low to trade. So it's 36,000 shares. Let's say you come in and trade 1,000 shares. So you're like 3% of the day's volume, if my math is correct on that, but you're enough if it's not, you know, okay? So I would I would leave that alone. I don't like gaps within the setup and it's just way, 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 way too thin. Okay, any more? Well, while we're in pass, obviously I wanna thank everybody for watching or attending, I should say. Again, if you wanna attend live, love to have you. Come in, throw some stocks out, ask some questions. Makes my job a lot easier, believe me. And the more the merrier again, but uh dayleonard.com slash webinar. So thanks everyone. Oh, you're welcome, Stuart. Stuart says, thanks, Dave. Enjoyed the session. Good show from Mark. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate you guys showing up. Thank you. Take your time out of your business schedule to be here. But anyway, um, I'll see most of you guys here tonight. I'll see you again. Uh, I'll see you tomorrow and Facebook. Everybody else, have a great, great weekend. And for everybody, may the trend be with you. Thank you so much.